So my name is David, David Adas. I'm uh, with IBM Research uh, for many years now. Um, I'm also work, uh, security work group lead in uh, Knative and uh, a member of the TOC. And I'm also the owner of uh, the guard code that we will also talk about uh, today. Yeah. yeah, my name is Roland Hus. I'm a software engineer working for Red Hat, where I dive into the world of OpenShift Serverless, which is a Knative distribution on top of OpenShift, and we make sure that it really works top notch on this. And I have to confess, so security is not my main gig, actually, but security is on my mind when I'm working on software and developing software or on products. And, um, but luckily, we have David here. So David is really the, the, the true security expert. And um, I would like to ask David now, so for the next 30 minutes, I hope I'm really eager to see what David has in, in the box for us, how we can improve our security on that. And I hope you enjoy this talk as well. <coughs> so next one. OK, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, fair to say that Everybody of us is really, when dealing with CVEs, it's like weathering a storm in our daily work. So CVEs pop up out of nowhere. And um, it's usually, some of them are small and are easy to fix, some of them are not. And it's really mostly an all hands on deck situation where you have to drop your work and start patching stuff like this. And, and of course, while we are really fighting with the CVEs and fixing them. The bad guys do this as well, of course, but not for patching those, but actually just to exploiting them and really to break through our defenses. And to be honest, this is really, as a developer, it's really exhausting. It's something, I'm, I'm a creator at heart, so I'm not a fixer. So I really want to be innovative, innovative and not really responsive and uh, just um, defend stuff like this. And uh, I think, but uh, I wonder really, and this is my question now to David, is really, do you think that we can kind of really stop this cat and mouse battle that we have break through this really cycle? Is there anything better than just having this reactive play with the, with the attackers or that? So this would be really, I'm really curious about that. Okay, so to, to really understand why the situation in the defense side is so dire, what we need to do is to see and understand the offender's ecosystem. So not only that offenders, of course, have uh, access to all the vulnerabilities that we are gladly publishing, they also have available exploits for many of them. And these are available to uh, offenders in a source code. They can modify them, they can improve them, morph them, such that they can evade um, our security def defenses. Now, um, Having an exploit and having the ability to uh, modify it and improve it is like having a key to the vulnerability, which is a door. But this key, the key, uh, the, the, it's important to know that this key doesn't open a single door. It opens a door, another door, and another door, and another door. It's the same key. Mm -hmm. So all I need to do as an uh, offender is try to use that key against enough doors to get in. Um, every door I open, is an opportunity for a profit, right? I can steal data, I can sell it, I can recruit the node to my botnet, I can rent or sell that botnet, I can do some extortion by using ransomware, I can make money out of open doors. So for me, it's really a very lucrative business. It's a great return on investment. I start a script, I then go to the beach spend many hours on the beach, then when I come back, I can see how much I made today in my hard work day. On the defense side, situation is a bit harder because a defender needs to protect against all keys. He needs to be 100% secured. And he, there is no way you're gonna have a description of all keys in your system to stop them. You create signatures or you uh, add signatures, maybe thanks to your security vendors, to your system to protect you from all kinds of exploits. But it's never 100%. It's 99.9. .9. But you have that list and your neighbor has a different list. And his neighbor has a different list because each one is using a different set of, of signatures. Now, for, for an offender, 
that's great. That just means that when I'm going to use that key, I'm going to find who, is, who doesn't have the right signature for that key, and I will go in, right? And this is why defenders sweat while offenders spend their time on the beach. And this is exactly what we need to change in order to make our life easier. Yeah, I totally understand that, David. So this is really something. And I wonder how we can go ahead in this game, so actually. You, you said, okay, we have to, usually you have to tra track all the, all the signatures that are available, the unique signatures like there. But isn't there a way how you can maybe prevent or detect exploit and then block them in advance without knowing the actual exploit? I think this would be really a, a good advantage, of course. Maybe then we, we can go to the beach as well. <laughs> We all hope so. <laughs> so put yourself in, in the uh, seat of a border control officer. Uh, are you using a, a list of signatures to decide who gets in or, or who doesn't? Do you have a long list of everyone who is a suspect, and then if he's a suspect, go send him for interrogation. And if he's not, let him in. I don't think that, that, that works. So how would you decide whether someone is a friend or a foe. You have three minutes. You can ask some questions. You can look at the history, at what, uh, what it said about that, that person, but, but previous uh, entries to the US or whatever. You have three minutes to decide. How would you do that? Maybe through extensive training, you would be able to identify that he's edgy or sweating or, or in some way confused, it doesn't fit what he says, it just doesn't make sense. So you say, okay, let's flag that one, send him for some more time that he would spend so that people would ask him questions before we let him into the US. So you're looking for some tells, you're looking for some indicators that would tell you that this person should not just let in before you, you look further into that uh, to, to that person, to that alien. Um, with cloud native, uh, what, what we need to do is, is quite the same. If you have a request coming in to a service, we should ask ourselves, what are the tells? How can we, we identify that this request is not, should not just let in? Um, this indicator that, that we are looking for this is what will help us identify that this request is not the normal situation. That's not what we expect. So it involves anomaly detection, but a very specific one, one that is tuned to what we should be looking, and what we should be looking is what we, we need to uh, further investigate. This can help us identify a suspicious request, but it can also help us identify a suspicious service, because if one of our services gets hacked, then it starts misbehaving, not behaving as the way it used to be behave before. So it can also help us detect uh, um, vulnerable uh, um, hacked services. The beauty thing about um, Cloud Native is that Cloud Native already did half the work for us, because we are already taking this monolith, this big workload, and dividing it into small pieces, a microservice, a serverless service, a function. And each such service has a very correct, well-characterized behavior. It does typically one thing. And therefore, it also expects to receive one type of request. And if that's the case, there is a good pattern also in the request and in the behavior of the this, this small set of code that process that request. So if there is good pattern, then we are good to go with trying to identify what in that pattern should be monitored in order to identify that it's, it is a, an exploit being sent or a service being hacked. Yeah, okay. Yeah. One, more, yeah, yeah. One, one more thing yeah. um, is that, that note that signatures are a denialist. They say all of these should not let, be let in. Security behavior analytics is looking for an allow list. It would say, okay, that's the okay behavior of a request. This is how request, this, this request for this service should look like. And now when you do something off, 
which is in security way, it is off, it is not correctly, not, doesn't seem right from a security perspective, then we should block it. Okay? Sorry. Yeah, okay. So I actually, I understand that. So, so it's a SPA is about recording the good behaviors, right? And, and of course, but then you have really also, you, you need somebody who collects all the good and also the bad behaviors and have this list. But this list is kind of, has also loopholes, yes? So attackers are, might also exploit those lists or find some ways around it. And is there any way how SBA can adapt to this behavior so that you uh, get, how we, can we analyze this behavior better? Or how, how can it work on this? Okay, so, so th this goes to really to the secret source of, of uh, uh, security behavior analytics. Uh, this is what the, is really important in, in, in that uh, technology, which is what exactly do I, am I monitoring? Or what are the tells? Um, and, and I would suggest that what we should be looking are the atoms from which the exploits are built from. We should be under, we should, instead of taking the fight to our end, we should be taking the fight to the offender's end. We should be asking what constitute an exploit that is being sent over the API. What is it that uh, is there which would let me, as a person, when looking at different requests, identify that this is an exploit? Curly brackets, a dollar sign, um, quotes, comma. All these appear normally in the field, right? But they're also essential for many exploits. So these are tells. Well, if they appear normally in the field and these are tells, how can I do anything about that? Well, I need to look at each and every value and examine it for itself. If there is a certain value and it's ne it never includes a dollar sign and suddenly I see a dollar sign, I should be asking questions. Because I already know that this value, when sent to that service, does not, is not expecting to see a dollar sign. Same goes for curly brackets and other indicators. And these could be uh, unreadable characters that are being sent or Unicode, um, a very long length, and many other indicators. And we can go on and on, make from simple indicators to a more complex and more complex indicators. Um, when, when I'm talking about each value, what I mean is that I'm, we are going to we're gonna have to analyze each header HTTP header with its value. We're going to need to analyze the query string. We're going to need to analyze the JSON body for each key and value. We need to use that structure that is being sent to us and look at each, each and every value inside separately such that we can evaluate its content. If its content include those indicators, yes or no, and which of the indicators exactly. This will help us identify when this value is now being used to carry an exploit. Okay, so I, I understand. So this sounds really very good. And uh, actually, I, I understand, okay, you, you really check the, the, the pattern and the format of the input and have some, some rules for that. And, but my big question is, so this sounds, yeah, sounds, sounds nice, but is this really a game changer? Is this really something that is disruptive in the sense that it really breaks the, the, the game, the, the, this battle that we have described at the beginning? Is there really, is it, what, what does SBA to actually to break this circuit? Okay, so, so to understand that, we need to, to look at those indicators as if they are different dimensions in a space. Um, and think about uh, um, a certain value, and in that value, you expect to see certain um, indicators go uh, activated. Um, and then, if, if that's the case, when these uh, indicators will, will get activated, it's like a subspace from the all possible indicators of the universe that we are monitoring, of course, all, all indicators that we are monitoring. Um, let's say that we cannot detect between an exploit and a good value in that, in, 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 in that specific value, in, that for, in the header of, of the user agent, for example. Then this means that both of them, if that was two-dimensional, look like a, a, a long line. So we cannot ex identify between the normal and the exploit. So we will need, in this case, to add another indicator. 
we would identify that we are missing an indicator that will help us see now a three-dimensional space identifying between normal and an exploit. And every time we added such an, uh, an indicator, it's not like a signature that only stops a very certain exploit. We are now making all values, uh, allow us, it allows in all values to see another aspect of an attack that we haven't seen before. So by growing our number of indicators, we can quickly reach a point where the, uh, the offender is losing any ability to send an exploit because everything that he's sending is being detected by the different indicators. So we are reducing the space of the offender and by doing so that, we actually actually starting to eliminate all the exploit that he has in his, in his, uh, in his uh, bucket of, of exploits um, from being effective against our system. Oh, oh, this is really a lot of theory, <laughs> Dave. David. So actually, um, do you have any, actually, I, I, is there anything that really is for real so that we can look at it? Do you, so what is the journey of SPA? Is there a tech tool which you can use for actually implementing these algorithms that you have demonstrated? And maybe you have even a demo for us. This would be super awesome. Not surprisingly, we have a demo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just, just a quick look at the history. Yeah. Um, let's see, where are, are we in the time? Okay. Um, so it used to be an IBM research project, and then we moved it to open source uh, as a K-native extension, and then we made some more work on it, such that we can use it in Kubernetes and in, in, uh, uh, in vanilla Kubernetes as a sidecar, um, and we can move and, and change this uh, to run uh, in any cloud-native environment. Um, oh, sorry. So the demo we're going to have, uh, we're going to uh, use is, is Log4Shell. I mean, I would expect most of you to, to be familiar with Log4Shell. It was very, very well known uh, two years ago. Um, and what we did is we took Log4Shell attack. We would first, first see that attack. Um, and that attack would uh, uh, in, um, install uh, WannaCry ransomware, and mimic, we would mimic uh, WannaCry ransomware being installed um, on a system, and then we would see how we can stop it with, with security behavior analytics, with Guard. Yeah, I do remember this look for shared thing. This was really a disaster. <laughs> yes, so the question is, do, do we need to wait for the signatures for log for shared yeah, exactly. or so can we stop it? It would, would have been good if it would be, have been prevented in advance, yeah? right? Yeah, so... Oh. So just, just uh, so we all understand the uh, demo, we have a naive client going, sending to a vulnerable uh, application. That vulnerable application logs the user agent. Um, now our attacker, what he needs to do, he needs to set up an RMI server somewhere and then send an exploit through a malicious client that will have in the user agent a certain string, this is an exploit, which would tell the vulnerable app to go to the malicious server, fetch some malware, and execute it. Okay? So let's start. So on the upper screen, on the yellow screen, we're gonna see the logs for the vulnerable app. On the middle screen, we're gonna see just the log for the RMI server, the malicious RMI server. So we're going to install WannaCry, and this is our client on green, and we sent a request. The user agent, as you can see, is curl. So uh, all, all nice and cozy. We'll try another client, so uh, we, we just see that it's working. And yes, we now see that uh, Mozilla is uh, the user agent. So this, uh, as an offender, uh, immediately send you to that spot of asking, okay, can I control the user agent? Can I control what is being logged? Um, I will try XYZ, and it logs XYZ. Excellent. Now I can try and send my exploit. So I'm sending an exploit. This is how the exploit looks like. It just tells the, the um, uh, uh, vulnerable app to go to the, the uh, malicious server. I'll stop just for a second. Notice that now what is being logged is the object handle, the object that was fetched from the malicious server. 
And, and this is because log4j has evaluated this expression, right? Yes, yeah. it, it evaluated that expression, that exploit, and then that evaluation resulted in going to the malicious server, RMI server, and fetching mm. whatever the result is, which then was executed in, in the client. And therefore, when we refresh, we find out that WannaCry was installed. Well, it's a mimic one. It's just uh, the, the page, don't worry. Um, so next, let's see what happens when we have uh, security behavior analytics. We, we run the security behavior analytics to begin with so that it knows the normal traffic, and we place it as a sidecar in front of the vulnerable app. So first of all, we run uh, uh, on top of the log for the vulnerable app, and in the middle, the log for the guard, uh, which would uh, uh, save it. This is a sidecar. And we send the first request. We see there is no alert, and a curl is being uh, written up. Uh, we send uh, XYZ, XYZ is being printed out, Guard is not, uh, has no concern about it, Mozilla, same, same thing, but then we would try to send out the exploit. Now, the important thing is that this request should not reach the vulnerable app, right? So, as you can see, it didn't. And what we see in the debug mode is that it, uh, it was blocked by a guard, in the, in the info, why it was blocked by guard, and it has some dollar sign and column sign and curly brackets and all kinds of things that we don't expect to see in a user agent from our experience with this request. Um, this is really the crucial po uh, moment where we say, okay, guard never saw log for shell. God is not aware of this specific attack. This could be a zero day as far as a guard is concerned. Everything is a zero day as far as guard is concerned. But to be, to be honest, most of us will not encounter a zero day in our systems. Most of the, of the exports we will see are exports that we just didn't cover ourselves well enough from. Which is meaning it is for us a zero day. It is something we are not prepared to, to protect from. Okay? So it's, 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 it's technology-wise, it's the same. Um, and one more thing is that, that guard is keeping all those rules, what, should, what is a normal situation in a guardian, which is uh, just a CRD on our, on our system. Uh, so the CRD then contains these rules to say, okay, no dollar signs are allowed with the braces around, so that it blocks it. So this, these yes. micro rules are then stored in a CRD. Oh, that's Correctly. The one. Yeah. Okay, and cool. and that's just see this uh, CRD, so we have uh, some sense of, of what it looks like. So it has some control, so block or don't block, learn or don't learn, and so on. And then a bunch of uh, keys and, and some numbers around there, which are not that hard to understand, and, and we will um, maybe talk about that a little later. Okay, oh, th this, this really sounds, sounds like a lot. So actually, you, and I guess the CRD gets really long if you have a lot of lists of all this thing. And uh, I wonder now, do I have to manage this list on my own, actually, or is it, I, I, I mean, uh, there's no general uh, one, size fits all situation. So actually you need to adapt this for all of your servers individually. But if you do this manually, I think this is, you still have a lot of work. So be more or less like, I don't, not sure whether this really makes my life much easier. Is there a way how this can be improved or make, make be easier? Yes. So just, just before I go to the other slide, I think, I think you raise a very important point mm -hmm. which maybe wasn't emphasized before. It's crucial for this defense that we will protect every service we would build this, uh, uh, you know, a suit for every service on its own. We are, it's not one, fi one uh, size fits all. We need a guardian first service. And, and the reason is because then we can really make sure that each value allow list is only limited to what is really necessary for that service. And this is a lot of work. Yeah. If, if me as a person needed to build one, then maybe I can do that, but then uh, the, the service changes, there is a new revision, there are other services. Just to maintain it becomes a nightmare. It's, it's hard. Um, and this is why the technology guard comes with um, a machine learning uh, uh, entity that would um, make sure that we have uh, a guardian being created automatically. Um, the, the way that this is done is that whenever a request comes in, is, com is coming in, 
we are profiling that request. That profile is then used for two different things. First, it's being sent, it is being piled with other requests of the same service, also from other pods. And then uh, that, that pile of requests is being processed in a machine learning in, in the God service in, in, to do some machine learning that would create all the micro routes for us. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that profile is being used against the existing profile that we, existing uh, guardian that we have to see whether this request should go in or not, should uh, um, bring up a, an alert or not. So these, these two things are being done with the same profile, and both of them are done as we go along. We don't, I mean, we can decide not to learn or to stop learning. These are things that we can do. We can decide whether to block or not, but both of them are, are, are done in one system immediately uh, at, at that side sidecar and, and the machine learning. Uh... Yeah, so machine learning. I think this is very, very, very helpful, but actually, I'm a little bit suspicious, to be honest. So because machine learning, you know, putting all this rule into some model, and uh, I'm not sure how this can be reasoned about, actually. Who explains me, actually, who, who tells me that I'm really sure? So if a CVE comes in, how do I know that this machine learning model is covering me? And then, of course, I have my, my auditor, you know, he comes by and he wants an audit, he wants some, some proof that it's safe. I, I don't see now at the moment as how SBA can do that, but maybe you, you have an idea how, you, how, how this can be improved. Yeah, so, so I agree, machine learning is, is spooky in some ways. Um, because if you can't understand what the machine learning is doing uh, as a human, then you don't know whether it will stop or it will not stop uh, an attack and you cannot explain to your auditor, yeah, and you, you, don't, you cannot change what is being decided. You cannot control what is being decided. But it's not true for all machine learning. Um, in Guard, what we have done is that we have uh, targeted um, as a design goal that the machine learning that will be used is a fairly simple one, actually. We are using a lot of small and simple and well-explainable learners. A big ensemble of them and then we are taking the decision based on the ensemble. So uh, that, that single decision, each, each value that needs to be decided and each indicator that needs to be decided, these are fairly simple to understand and to reason about. So it's all human comprehensible and human controlled. Uh, so human oversight over the machine learning is doable if you decide that this is your design goal. Uh, if we would build uh, a large neural network to see the request holistically and decide based on that, then we will have a problem. Also, the beautiful thing about small learners is that they learn really quick. So we don't need many samples to figure out what the request look like. Okay, yeah, this all sounds great. So actually this is okay, but you have more, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that also. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so just to, to um, show you how, how easy it is to understand it, we, th this same CRD that you see here is actually um, translatable into a very simple UI. We just uh, define what, uh, what are the um, um, special characters that are allowed, how many characters, um, how many numbers are allowed, how many special characters are allowed in that field, all, all kind of small indicators which are all effective in order to stop um, uh, an attack, an, an export from, from coming in. Um, on, on, on different situations. Okay, that, that, that's really great. I think this is very helpful also for, for my work. But I have now kind of a, a random question actually. So I heard something about a concept called zero trust. I know a little bit what it, this means, but I'm not 100% clear how the relationship of SBA to zero trust is actually. I know I heard some rumors that there are some paper in the works from the tech security around zero trust. Maybe you can shed some light on this, how SBA relates to zero trust. This would be all. Awesome. I'm really curious. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, th just, just to make sure that everyone is uh, online, uh, uh, in line with, as far as zero trust is concerned. So if traditional uh, uh, security is perimeter-based, making sure that uh, the bad guy will not come in through the perimeter, zero trust assumes that the bad guy is already in. Yeah? So... It's like a terminal, like an um, air, airport terminal, where you just treat everyone as a suspect. If you walked in the terminal, um, 
recently you, you know the feeling. You're being questioned and you're being monitored in many different ways, not only cameras. Uh, and that's the attitude, that's the kind of thinking that goes be behind zero trust. So in zero trust, everyone is a suspect, meaning any request could be sending, could be a way to deliver an exploit. It could come from a beautiful person that we know very well and has great credentials, and he proved his credentials. But he may be already hacked. So someone else is using his machine to send an exploit. So we saw a lot of good stuff from him, but this one is a, in a, an exploit. Meaning we need to actually monitor everything that we see. Um, and everything will go wrong. So every request at some point may include an exploit. And every service that we'll have at some point will get hacked. Um, with SBA, um, sorry, with uh, uh, Zero Trust, um, we must we, with zero trust, we must, uh, um, um, in order to, to treat the situation where everyone is a suspect, we need to evaluate every request and every service for its confidence level. How confident we are that this request is okay, that this service is okay. In order to evaluate that, SBA is a great tool to do that. Because SBA would tell us if we see, if we see indicators for that uh, request being uh, an exploit, for, for example. Then we go to access control in zero trust. And in zero trust, we will have in access control a decision. Well, if the risk is very low, then do allow him to do all of that. But if the risk is higher, then maybe don't allow him to do all the sensitive stuff, but do allow him still go in and so on. Okay, great. I, I, I think, uh we are close to the end of the, uh, the session, so maybe we wrap up now. So but there's one little thing which I'm still next me a little bit. So um, it's really so you said uh, having SBA is not an all or nothing or the general solution for everyone. So you need to individualize it for every service. Do you have any recipes how you can run this uh, SBA in production so that it's for real world uh, use cases? Okay, so, so if I would to use this technology in a, in, in a real environment, um, I would probably make sure that as part of my CI system, I would uh, deploy the service uh, into a testbed, run a good set of um, uh, requests against it, and use that opportunity to build the Guardian. So I only go, already go into the field with a guardian based on what I've done in the testbed. Now that I have that on the field, I would probably get some false positives in the beginning because maybe not all of my tests were completed all the possibilities that are out there. Well, that's an opportunity to improve my tests, but also an opportunity to uh, make sure that, uh, uh, to, to check that uh, what I see is okay. Um, what I can do further is that I can move from a learned bucket into a configured bucket, copy my, my uh, um, learn bucket into a configured bucket, and then tweak there all the microservices manually. One last point. Yeah, so this is the last point. So actually, I'm, I'm from Reddit, I'm an open source believer, but I have heard also people who say, no, security is better hidden in proprietary so software because they have the secret source. What is your take on that? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, for me, this is an opportunity. I see that as an opportunity for the community um, because that's, that's a, a place where we can, if we join forces to, and, and we build the right indicators and share them, uh, we get to that point where we actually eliminate the tool set that the uh, offenders have. Well, they can still use those exploits against others, but uh, when they're going to use them against microservices or, or cloud services, cloud native services, they're going to find out that those exploits are no longer uh, viable. And in, in a way, at some time, they would realize that going after those, uh, um, those cloud services is, is useless. It's just a, a waste of uh, um, energy. Um, so uh, th this is one option. The other option is to continue doing what we are already doing. 
and, and sweat. So, um, hopefully, we will choose the option of, of sharing our forces and, and uh, um, uh, working together against uh, um, the offenders. Okay, thank you very much. We are, have run out of time, so uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the session. And if there are questions, c come here and uh, maybe you try out uh, Security Guard. It's part of Canadian, as mentioned. And thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the good con. Thanks. You, you, can contact, you can contact us on, on Slack. Yeah. We're all, of course, on, on Slack or on LinkedIn. Okay. Be happy to ask a question there and hereafter and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.